Welcome to another reading from the Mysterious Benedict Society by Trenton Lee Stewart. Today we will be starting with the chapter called A Surprising Suggestion. The message broadcasts were hard on all of them. They felt another one during lunch the next day. It was Corliss Danton, according to Constance, which had them gritting their teeth, growling at each other, and fighting the urge to throw silverware. And another came during the evening, so that they were compelled to study with their nerves being plucked like banjo strings. The last broadcast finally relented just as Rainey was closing his notebook. He had laid his head on his desk in relief. I am so glad that's over, said Sticky, who had spent study, study time lying on his bed grimacing. You finished? With an effort, Rainey nodded. They heard Jackson's booming voice in the hallway announcing lights out. I'll get the light, Kate said, dropping to the floor behind Rainey. Rainey gasped and fell out of his chair. Sticky banged his head on the top bunk. Kate switched off the light and climbed onto a chair to help Constance down from the ceiling. Maybe you should start knocking, Sticky grumbled, rubbing his head. And spoil the surprise? Kate asked. Listen, Rainey said, scrambling back up. I've been going over Mr. Benedict's message in my, mind, my head all day, and I think I'm starting to figure it out. What is it Mr. Benedict sent us here to get? information, Sticky said. You think that's what he meant by what can be got? Just information? Secret information, Rainey said, which is why we need to become messengers as soon as possible. We must become what we are not. Constance rolled her eyes. But that's obvious. We already know that. You're right, Rainey admitted. That's why I said I'm starting to figure the message out. I think there must be more to it. I'm just not sure what, except that we need to hurry up. We're going as fast as we can, though, Kate said. You boys are making perfect scores on the quizzes, and Constance and I, well, we're doing our best, aren't we? She glanced doubtfully at Constance. At least I know I am. What's that supposed to mean? Constance said, frowning. I just don't want to speak for you, said Kate evasively. My point, Rainey interjected, was that we have to find a way for you and Constance to do better on the quizzes. Ugh, Kate said, heaving a dramatic sigh. She collapsed onto the floor, throwing out her arms as if she'd been knocked flat. To tell the truth, I think I'm beyond help. My brain simply won't absorb that nonsense, no matter how hard I try. Same here, said Constance. No way can I improve on those quizzes. I'm too tired to study any more than I already do. Which is hardly any, Kate muttered. Constance flared. Let's see you study with voices spouting gibberish in your head. At least I've been trying. Hold on, hold on, Rainey said. Let's go back to Mr. Benedict's message. What can we think of that we are all not? Grown-ups, Sticky suggested. True, Rainey said gently, but I don't think we can hurry up and get older, can we? Constance pointed out that none of them were antelopes eating cantaloupes or textbooks with hexed looks or cattle from Seattle. You're just trying to annoy us, aren't you? Kate said. Constance grinned. The fact is, Sticky said in a defeated tone, there are an infinite number of things that we aren't. Yes, but Mr. Benedict expects us to figure this out, said Rainey, so we should be able to narrow it down. Let's consider what he knows about us, something we all have in common, something that could be changed. He only just met us, Kate pointed out. He can't know that much about us, can he? Well, he knows we're orphans and runaways, Sticky offered, then quickly added, I know, I know, we can't all suddenly have families, so what else? We're all gifted said Constance. We all passed his silly tests. And none of us watches television or listens to the radio, said Kate, because of our mind's unusually powerful love of truth, right? Sticky scratched his head. I don't see how watching television is going to make us messengers any faster. Wait a minute, Rainey said, leaping to his feet. Our love of truth. The others fell silent and looked at him. Rainey had begun to pace and whisper to himself, become what we're not to become messengers faster. And Mr. Benedict knows that we're not because 
Yes, I think I have it. Kate shone her flashlight at Rainey, who stopped in his tracks. His exultant expression shifted into one line of doubt, and he squinted uncomfortably in the flashlight beam. He cleared his throat, hesitated, and cleared his throat again. Well, Constance demanded, what's the big idea? At last, Rainey managed to come out with it, and it was no wonder the others hadn't thought of it themselves, for what Rainey suggested was something that would never have occurred to them, something quite foreign to their natures, something none of them had ever attempted. They must learn how to cheat. It only makes sense, Rainey quickly explained when he saw his friend's horrified expressions. None of us accepted Rhonda's offer to cheat, remember? That was part of the test. Mr. Benedict is saying we must become what we are not, cheaters, so we all can become messengers more quickly. You've got to be kidding, Kate cried. That can't be what Mr. Benedict means. Sticky was shaking his head. Didn't he choose us because we didn't cheat? Well, I'm all for it, Constance said with a snort. Let's cheat like the wind. Kate was appalled. I can't believe you two. Where's the powerful love of truth Mr. Benedict talked about? Rainey wasn't surprised by his friend's responses. He too had been wary of the notion when it occurred to him. But were they not secret agents? Was not this their very presence on the island a deception? Kate and Sticky's reaction was just an instinctive response, he thought. They would come around in a minute. Still, Rainey was troubled by Kate's question. Where was his powerful love of truth? His mind resisted the hidden messages, but maybe not as much as his friends did. How could he know? Had he been sorely tempted to cheat on Mr. Benedict's tests when Rhonda made the offer? Was he perhaps not quite the truth-loving brave soul Mr. Benedict and everyone else thought him to be? Get real, Constance was saying. Mr. Curtin is the big deceiver, remember? We can beat him at his own game. Kate and Sticky had their doubts, but they were less adamant now. Sticky was polishing his glasses, saying he supposed it might be all right, and Kate had begun to pace, saying, it's just that I never imagined myself. I don't know, it's just hard for me to think that way. Rainey, do you really think that's what Mr. Benedict is suggesting? There's one way to find out, said Rainey, who really hoped he was right. Not because he wanted to cheat, but because if cheating was Mr. Benedict's idea rather than his, his own, Rainey would feel better about himself. Sticky sent their query at once. Please advise about cheating. A few minutes later, a light began to flat, flashing in the woods. Sticky relayed the message as it came. Do not, I guess that settles it, Kate said. There's more, said Sticky. The rest of the message was this, get caught. I guess that settles it, said Constance. Cheating practice occupied the mysterious Benedict Society for two full hours that night. The moment the children received permission, they applied themselves to finding the best strategies for earning without learning, as Constance called it. None of them had ever tried it before, and at first they made a very poor showing indeed, but they were nothing of not quick learners. And by the time they called it a night, they all felt reasonably confident that they could cheat a cheater out of cheating lessons, nine times out of 10. Their hard work paid off the next morning. The girl's quiz scores finally began to improve. Given her height and sharp eyesight, it was simple enough for Kate to sit behind Rainey and copy over his shoulder, while Rainey kept his paper at a helpful angle. Their greatest difficulty lay in watching out for witnesses, but Kate and Rainey were good at this and their teamwork produced excellent results. In fact, they were so heartened by their success that not even the morning's hidden message broadcasts dimmed their optimism. Sticky and Constance's cheating strategy was more complicated. Constance was too short to copy over a shoulder and note passing was much too risky. So at last, Rainey had suggested Morse code. Notoriously fidgety, Sticky signaled the answers by tugging at his ear or tapping his temple. Motions he disguised with head scratches, collar straightening, and spectacle polishing. And Constance sat in the back row where none of the other students would notice her watching him. The strategy worked, but not without problems. In the corridor between classes, Constance complained under her breath, every time you have a real itch, I get the wrong answer. Sorry, Sticky said sheepishly. I get itchy when I'm nervous. I'll try to do better. 
Don't just try, Constance said. Actually do better. Hey, my fidgeting isn't the only problem, you know, Sticky hissed. It would help if you had practiced your Morse code at all. Constance's face turned so red. Her pale blue eyes glistened so brightly behind angry tears, and her wispy blonde hair was in such a state of dishevelment that she looked more like a small child's painting of a person than an actual person herself. A fierce display of vivid colors in odd proportions. She seemed to have stepped right out of a canvas for the sole purpose of throwing a fit. Now, children, Kate said in a motherly tone, stepping between them, let's not quibble about who's to blame. Blaming is wrong. The important thing is to get along with one another so that we may have better success cheating. Not funny, said Constance, but the joke did take the edge off her fury and she said no more. Nor did Sticky, who regretted his outburst, not least because it was imprudent to discuss cheating in the corridor, and even more worse to mention Morse code. Was he crazy? What if he'd been overheard? The very prospect of the waiting room made him woozy. And so the morning passed, struggling to ignore hidden message broadcasts, concentrating on the lessons, cheating on every quiz. The four had a bit more to think about than the other students, yet the boys continued making perfect scores. The girls were coming along nicely. The broadcasts eventually let up, and by lunchtime, everyone was in an upbeat mood. At the same time, they were on high alert for clues. Between classes, they'd heard the rumor that Charlie Peters, one of the oldest messengers at the Institute, was graduating. He hadn't been in class all day, and some executives had been seen with him in the dormitory that morning. This was the usual thing, someone said. Graduates never spoke to a soul when they left. Apparently, they were too high and mighty even to say goodbye to old friends. They had no choice, said another student. The executives never allowed it. I wonder what that's all about, Rainey said as they made their way to the cafeteria for lunch. Good question, Kate said, and here's our chance for some answers. She pointed down an adjoining corridor where SQ Pedalion had just appeared, escorting Charlie toward a distant exit. Quick, you try to talk to him while I distract SQ. How do you propose to do that? Constance asked, but Kate had already dashed off down the corridor and Rainy and Sticky were hurrying after her. SQ, hey SQ, Kate called out. I wanted to ask you a question about your lecture this morning. SQ turned to see Kate barreling toward him. I'm afraid I can't talk right now. But before SQ could finish, Kate took a spectacular fall. Her feet shot out from under her. Her arms and legs flew in every direction. Her bucket changed and scraped across the stone floor, sending up sparks. And at last, with her feet first in front of her and then somehow behind her, Kate tumbled and slid to a stop a few yards away from SQ, where she did a very convincing job of rolling her eyes back into her head. Kate! SQ cried, hurrying to check on her as the boys came running up. Step back, he ordered. Give her room to breathe. As Kate made a great production of fluttering her eyelashes and rolling her eyes loopily about, Rainy and Sticky edged past SQ to talk to Charlie Peters, who stood a little distance away, gazing impassively down the corridor, apparently not the least interested in Kate's fate. A terribly pale boy with pale eyes, pale hair, and pale skin, Charlie looked like a figure made of wax. When the boys approached, he didn't even acknowledge them. He wore a faintly confused expression, as if he couldn't see why he had to leave the Institute, why he couldn't just keep on being a messenger forever. She'll be fine, Rainy said, jerking a thumb toward Kate, as if Charlie might actually care. Falls down a lot, but she always recovers. What? Charlie said, looking at the boys for the first time. Rainy's face took on a sympathetic expression. Oh, I guess your mind's on other things since you're graduating. No one can blame you for that. I bet you're sad to go, aren't you? You'll miss all those special privileges? What special privileges? Charlie said wearily. I don't remember any special privileges. Being a messenger is a responsibility, a matter of leadership. When you're a messenger, you're so busy helping Mr. Curtin that you hardly have time to think. In fact, Charlie said, looking disappointed now. In fact, it seems like only yesterday I was made messenger and now I'm going home already. I've been so busy that everything in between seems like a blur. Busy doing what? Sticky asked. 
Behind them, SQ was struggling to help Kate back to her feet. Kate was making it difficult by slipping on things that had spilled from her bucket. Charlie grew agitated. He glanced left and right and fixed them with a decidedly suspicious look. I can't say. But why not? Rainy urged. Did they threaten you? Can you tell us anything? Charlie shook his head doubtfully. He seemed to be considering, though, and the boys felt their hopes rise. Then he shook his head again, more vigorously this time. He seemed extremely distressed by their questioning. I can't say, he repeated. I really can't. Lucky to be alive, SQ was saying to Kate behind them. Then his voice sharpened. Hey, you boys get away from Charlie. Okay, bye, Charlie, Rainy said quickly, and Sticky gave a playful salute. But Charlie only stared at them with a distraught expression, as if they'd done him some grievous wrong. Casting the boys a disapproving look, SQ took Charlie's arm and led him away toward the exit. Any luck? asked Constance, who had finally come down the corridor and was standing there conspicuously unhelpful as Kate gathered her things. Rainy picked up Kate's slingshot and handed it to her. He isn't talking. He wouldn't say why. I did all that for nothing, cried Kate, dismayed. I'm not sure, Rainy said. There's something curious about what Charlie said. Something, he frowned. I'm going to have to think about it. Anyway, Kate, don't tell us you didn't enjoy doing that, Sticky said. That's true, I did, Kate admitted with an impish grin. How did it look? Like you fell out of an airplane. Rainy said as they started toward the cafeteria again. Really? Kate gazed at him with shining eyes. She was deeply touched. And that's the end of that chapter.